I didn't do my work now and, and, and just split flamenco. I would mm-hmm. have to do a lot more teaching or something like that to survive and probably I would tell them cannot cannot go on holiday so much and go to Changi Beach only. <laughs> <laughs> John from the Tropical Arts Club here, and we have received some feedback about our prior episodes that 40-minute videos are a little bit long. What we had in mind was having it play in the background while you work, perhaps on two times speed. And you can just click the little button, I'll just put a picture of it here, that will speed up video two times and make you hyper efficient. Hit that 2x button, hit subscribe, hit like, and enjoy this episode of the Tropical... Tropical Arts Club! Ta-da! Thank you all for coming down to our show, even though you're sitting down in the comfort of your home watching us. We really appreciate it because today we do have someone special, especially in my life. Mm -hmm. When I was 18 and I was a law student thinking about whether to go into the arts full time, I had met this person and her company and the way they live their lives as dancers and people really inspired me to go into the arts kind of full time and not be afraid to take risks. So this next person is Dr. Daphne Huang Vargas, who is a doctor in a geriatric home. She's also the director of Flamenco Sinfonteras, a flamenco dance theater company here in Singapore. And they are located in Geelang, if you ever want to check them out. And she is one of the best flamenco dancers in Singapore and maybe the world. But it's probably not my place to say but in Singapore, yes. And she is a proud mother of two, Lydia and Simon. I hope you're watching your mom. A wife of famous flamenco dancer, Antonio Vargas, and pet owner of Cookie. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daphne Huang Vargas. Oh, hi. Welcome, Daphne. Hi. May I? Oh. Thank you for Welcome coming. to the show. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yes, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> okay, so well, we're going to start off with kind of getting to know um, what your life is like. Because mm-hmm. you do many things in your life. You are a mother. Mm-hmm. You are a pet owner. You are a director of a dance company. And you are a flamenco dancer. And you are a geriatric doctor. So All we're those things. wondering what does your week look like? Okay, so... Um, from Monday to Fridays, I work in uh, as a general practitioner in uh, nursing homes. So I usually wake up and only have coffee mm-hmm. and run out to work. Uh, some days, work is a little bit less hours, half days. Some days, it's uh, almost a full day. And uh, I usually have lunch at home, so I come back. And it's sometimes a normal lunch time and sometimes it's a very late lunch. And then after that, uh, sometimes I see my kids. They have come home from school by then. Uh, and sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> I do catch up with Antonio. Sometimes having to do a, a little bit of um, paperwork or, or, or admin stuff for the company. Uh, sometimes in the afternoon, I will uh, catch some self-practice or rehearse some things. When we have projects, especially in the afternoons, we have some rehearsals. And then when it comes to the evening, uh, we, I usually have a very late dinner mm-hmm. because uh, I usually use the evenings. Uh, only, I either have classes in the evening, I have a class once a week, or I have to catch up on paperwork or sometimes I'm out doing something and then I have dinner and then I see my kids. Uh, and I see my dog. <laughs> well, I don't feed my dog, my husband does. <laughs> and uh, the weekends are uh, done with sometimes with classes, uh, sometimes with uh, rehearsals, uh, and catching up with the family, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Sweet. And do you have time for yourself? Um, <laughs> well, sleeping, catching up on Facebook. Very important. <laughs> Daydreaming. <laughs> for the audience at home who's trying to visualize the life, describe Cookie. Oh, describe Cookie. Cookie is our little poodle. He's about three and a half years old. Uh, we bought it for my son, Simon. Mm. 
uh, well, he's uh, he's uh, he's a very little toy poodle. So, um, so th- you want me to describe the life of Cookie or the life of the life of Cookie? Oh, I was just hoping your audience would imagine what Cookie looks like as oh, you tell the story. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm. Cookie, Cookie, it is 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 the color of a cookie biscuit. I oh, think that's what so cute. He's brown. <laughs> Little brown. Is, is this a size is his, of his, his, uh, Tell me about stop, that. Right? Is, uh, uh, yeah, is he smaller than a very big cat? Actually, he's very small. He's Ooh. like he's like that. <laughs> we will like we leg. will put a picture of Cookie, cookie here. Yes. We'll put two cookies. And hopefully, all you pet owners out there can join and watch us on this show. I heard puppies get more views. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's move back to the arts. Daphne, could you tell us how you got into something as unique as flamenco? Okay, it's, it's a short and long story, so I'll tell you the short story. The short story is that um, I got into flamenco very late in life. Mm-hmm. Was, um, uh, I was studying to actually initially do a specialist degree, which I decided then not to do. <laughs> so suddenly I had free time, and I was like basically just looking for a hobby as a young adult doctor. Okay, not that young, but quite young <laughs> adult doctor. And uh, I tried a few things. I tried the uh, Latin ballroom, mm. salsa, uh, uh, Argentinian tango. And suddenly one day I saw an article about flamenco. I never heard about it before. And that's how I stumbled over it, on it. And um, later I did a workshop uh, in New Nausea, which was near Perth, where Antonio was giving a workshop. And, and that really open my eyes to what flamenco is about because I've never been to Spain before that and you know that time no YouTube or anything like that yet okay so you can tell my age but no YouTube or things like that so it's not like you could Google and and see what flamenco was unless you really went there and then um, after that my friend Tilly uh, um, organized Antonio to do workshops here and then that's how I got involved mm-hmm. in Antonio later on and then um, then we had a family and that's how we started and then, and then that's how I, st- I mean that's how I started doing flamenco as a mm-hmm. hobby, but then after that, you know, I, I took it more seriously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and tell me what made you want to become a doctor? I oh, want. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's like when you're seventeen and eighteen, then you have to choose what you're gonna do. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I was a little bit of a bookworm as younger. I'm the kind mm-hmm. that I got like. Like, like really good grades la. I got all A's I think mm-hmm. except for Chinese <laughs> and um, and looking at all the options uh, I thought like you know they had people tell, uh, coming and telling you what it was about so to me um, being a doctor sounded more attractive than mm. the other p- professions that, that, that you know like lawyer dentist engineer <laughs> accountant and of course at that time I was not like I was not trained in the arts so dancer or, or actress or something like that mm. was never in the question I knew I wasn't qualified like I had no qualifications to do so yeah. what was the perception of these artsy careers like actress or dancer back when you were picking your career uh, well okay so mm. I come from the, the time uh, maybe it's still the same but of course I come from the time when our parents would, would think that they um, you know, um, having an arts career is not a career. That's not an option. It's like being an artist is not a career. Like, you will stop or, you, you, or there's no job. <laughs> there's no such job. <laughs> so, so they naturally just thought of careers being something, you know, like you mm-hmm. would go to university or you go to polytechnic. And because um, it was like the time where grades method, like passing exams method, and, you know, we did like, tons of 10 year series and get our A's you know like that yeah so I was one of those okay I got all my A's through doing tons of 10 year series believe me <laughs> and, 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 and then okay then the next part is that what will you want to study in, I mean if you qualify to go uni it will be our mm-hmm. first choice that what do you want to study in uni it was like that yeah. I see and did you enjoy med school? Yeah, I enjoyed med school actually. I enjoyed med school because, uh, of all things, I thought med- medicine was one of the things that was both a science and an art mm. when mm. it comes to treating people. I mean, treating la- uh, like the diagnosis of things are, is not something that's that clear cut. You know, there's a process, and then treating a, a person who's your patient, it's 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 an art because it's also not it's not always black and white. You know, mm-hmm. 
yeah I mean you have to do your best and do no harm but in between that that that, that, that is a lot of things that are uh, that are not like uh, true and false yes or no it's not <laughs> like that <laughs> and how did you find your way into geriatric medicine okay I'm um Initially, because when I decided not to specialize, then I came out being a general practitioner in clinics, and I, I found that I, I didn't really want like sitting down in the clinic for eight hours a day, <laughs> I only could tolerate half a day, <laughs> and then, um, one of my initial thoughts of wanting to specialize was actually to do palliative medicine, which is like um, treating people who. Who, who terminal, terminal ill, Ill. Mm. so so then when I decided not to specialize then um, I decided um, to try to do work in nursing homes and then the, of course there's another reason because I, by that time later on I was also more involved in the flamenco and and had a company so also being a doctor in nursing home gave me a little bit more flexi hours mm. than like a, a strict 9 to 5 clinic job yeah Wow, and then uh, mm. when you decided to start a flamenco dance company in Singapore, um, can you tell us a bit more about the time, like when you decided to start it, like what the industry was like within dance companies, um, and like how were the challenges like? Okay, so when I started the dance company, I mean I, I did flamenco not definitely not thinking it was going to be any sort of like career path or anything that was the last thing I like I, I did it like as a hobby like like the way you go and do Zumba class if you have a hobby or aerobics or something else so is a <laughs> professional yeah. Zumba instructor it is my job yeah it's one of so them. I'll be like one of your aunties there doing Zumba yeah. to get paid so yeah. that was like like literally like that <laughs> so um, and I, I told you like because my, 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 my path was very academic like you know other than going discos to clubs and dance <laughs> I never had like even a, a ECA that was like in the arts <laughs> so, <laughs> so what ECA were you in? Um, at first was track and field because I, I, I won my 800 meters on, in my school anyway yeah. wow. and then yeah. then was track and field across country and somehow in JC I took up canoeing I, I was not a very bad canoeist, but I don't know why I took out canoeing. So anyway, I did not have any ECA. Well, I was in the university because I studied at the Marine for three years. I did have some, some. I started to have some dance hobby or ECA, other than going to the club. And I was <laughs> doing Latin ballroom. I did some Latin ballroom, ballroom dancing. Well, and I only did that, uh, not because I was particularly interested in ballroom of all things, was because my friends were doing it and then they dragged me there. So I ended up doing that as a, you know, like like the university ECA mm. for about two years. And then I came back to Singapore, actually. Yeah. Then, mm. um, so, okay. So anyway, uh, because my, 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 my history was not in the arts, so mm-hmm. um, I never ever thought of opening a company or anything like that. Or even a school or even being a dancer of any sort. And I was really <laughs> meeting Antonio and then having the practical issue initially that um, Antonio wants to, to to try to settle in Singapore because like his work was always overseas was never in Singapore so the flamenco circle in Singapore was too small also to sustain any form of work actually uh, other than doing some workshops here and there and, and the community was very small but we tried to find a way that the community could grow and that there would be something that so actually it was from a very practical point of view so we set up a company so he had a work permit and then he started some classes and then um, at that time I had some people who were, my friends who were doing flamenco and then there were other people like Koshi who started to come to Singapore and we invited them to join us and of course Antonio being the artist he is he straight away thinks of like all this huge artistic project <laughs> and like how are we going to like do this type of thing you know like I had no clue because I was not in arts <laughs> Scene whatsoever, and um, and then I found out. I found out like oh, so at first he thought like we could just hire and then you like hire a venue and then like you just put on a show. You mm-hmm. See that or, like put on like like a work in progress and then I remember I I I, I checked out venues. I'm like oh my goodness, it's so expensive. Like even we saw all the tickets, 
You also cannot cover anything. Yes, oh, this yeah. is a real problem in the art scene. <laughs> yes, that artists mm. don't have enough money for venue spaces. So, good thing that you brought it up. Yeah. Oh yeah. So so when he wanted to do a progress like years years ago, and I found the band, I, I think it's impossible. I say it from. I mean. The good thing about it is not that I got logic. So like, okay, logically, if like if we cannot, if we sell all the tickets and we cannot cover the cost, this is impossible. So we cannot do this. <laughs> so we just, you know, did, 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 um, at first just did our classes and things and then grew the, and then of course, uh, with time, like more flamenco came in. We had like people who were good in flamenco joining us. And then we are like able to form like a small group of people who could perform. And then, he was still very ambitious, so he was, we still tried to do, you know, small little things. So we we did we like we did this small thing in the arts limited, uh, called the uh, five dreams, and that was our first first thing as as any form of company. And 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 that time we were not registered. I just decided to call ourselves Flamenco Sin Fronteras. We we call we we call ourselves Flamenco without borders because we are out of Singapore. I mean we are out of Spain, and we are all like um. We, also represent people of like different ethnic groups mm. doing flamenco. And that was our first formal, I mean like, performance as this group, right? And it was like an informal name. We, we, we didn't form a non-profit company at that point. And then the next year, somehow we managed to get Chimes interested in like putting out a festival and we wow. and had some sponsorship for Encore. We brought in three like really really big artists, like Talikon and Talikona and Jose, and we did a festival in Chimes, right? And that was only through the support of Chimes with Encore that we managed to do this. At the point, I still didn't know that we there was arts grant and you know I was very swaku. I didn't I didn't know where to look for the money. <laughs> so then after that, after that, like oh, that's the first time we had, we did something of a big scale and it was you know like it was really well received and. And then Antonio really wanted to do this, 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 his, his dance theatre project, right? We, we really wanted to put like the house of Bernada Elba. That was the first time like I told you he, he started on it and I said it's too expensive. We cannot, cannot like even try to do any work in progress in Singapore. <laughs> it's like ridiculous. I think cannot. <laughs> so from there, then, then I decided to find out how we're going to do this. Like practically, of course he wasn't from here. So he knows that in Australia, other countries, mm. you have grants or but he didn't know how it worked here. He's like a foreigner here, right? Mm. He just he just came to live in Singapore. So and I didn't know either. <laughs> so and I and also the people with us um were not like people who were in the arts art scene. So mm. we all didn't know how to find the money. And I started like I think by then maybe that's Google. So I started finding out <laughs> <laughs> that there were such things called the National Arts Council. National <laughs> Arts Council, yes. And the Arts Council. So, and, and, and foundations who could give money. Okay, I found that out. And then I found out, oh, but then at that time, you only could apply usually if, um, as a company, it was if you're a non profit. So then we decided whether we really want to be non profit. I, I didn't know the headaches I had. To go through being non-profit, but at that time we thought that 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 it was easier to be non-profit if you wanted to tap all this money, mm-hmm. which is true. Like yeah. like some of the foundations only give you if you're non-profit. Mm. So we then went on to this big road to become a legal non-profit company, um, which comes with a lot of headaches. But anyway, <laughs> that that was my first time that, that's how it started like like why we, we transitioned from the informal thing mm. to wanting to do this project and looking at my, the funding for it and trying to tap money becoming non-profit and then from there we did our first uh, formal dance theatre project as a registered non-profit company which Shanice was in <laughs> that yeah, was the my house my first in show as a professional like artists yeah. in the scene yeah mm-hmm. yes so from there on then we went on to do other productions and then of course i started um well being in the know-how to write grants and look out for deadlines midnight <laughs> 11 55, 55. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And for everyone out there who doesn't know what a dance company does, could you run us through what Flamenco Sin Fronteras does as a company? Okay, um, we have our own productions, so that's mm. the one I have to find money for, that we want to try to put it in a theatre. And then also because in Flamenco, um, we don't have like um, a lot of Flamenco musicians in Singapore, so for mm -hmm. the bigger productions, we usually have to find people, so that's also added cost. Mm. Um, and, and, and so uh, we do, like for example, um, this year we're going to restage the house and we, we, we kind of, we started doing our own festival and like now mm. we try to do it every once every two years where we have a production and then we have another, uh, a, a smaller uh, performance next to it and then sometimes we have workshops, we even have talks. So in the past, like we have done uh, Misa Flamenca, which was, and we, we often collaborate and, and mm. try to cross culture. So in the past, we have done Misa Flamenca, we have, which was choral work, classical work with flamenco. So we mm. ha were working with Robert Castiles and a group of classical singers collaborating with us. And then we had uh, The Elements, which was a Chinese uh, uh, philosophy talking about the five Chinese elements with Flamenco. Wow, okay. So we had a group of musicians with other uh, the direction of Kailin that had to transpose like the flamenco music and to use Chinese instruments to play mm -hmm. them. And then we uh, our dancers also had to use Chinese props as part of it. For example the the the, the, the long sleeve and then the Chinese fan mm -hmm. and the swords or something like that. Okay. So that those are our productions. So the productions is usually something that had to plan a little bit ahead. Mm -hmm. That uh, usually the cost much outweighs the, <laughs> the venue and the tech and the lighting and everything where everything comes up. <laughs> and then when uh, after, when the money comes in, then we'll see how much we have to trim. Yeah, and and usually for for productions, the good thing about our company mm -hmm. dancers is they are not. Um, they are not. They are not. Uh, insistent like okay I must get paid like you know like a job I can get my take my one thousand my five hundred everybody knows that this is 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 a production that usually the, the, the cost much outweighs the the the, the um, what we get and and like as long as we don't lose money mm -hmm. we, we are we are we feel safe like as in we don't lose money so those are the productions that I really have to find money for. And then we also do community projects. Mm. For example, we're working with the Singapore Mental Health, Child Street 11 seniors. And uh, I also apply funding, like sometimes we tag with the festival and sometimes it's a separate thing where we do uh, projects for the community and then we try to showcase them in some sort of a performance setting and like mm. a sharing setting, which is, and the performance is usually free. Uh, so, but we then we have to find the money to, to you know like even to put it up mm -hmm. and then um, besides this those two um, the rest of what we do is self-funding because we don't we don't have any sort of like uh, grant to keep the company going so everything is, is, is the projects are always on a PMP grant which is like one-off grants mm -hmm. so everything else we, we, we have to run by ourselves which are generally the classes Mm -hmm. classes um, and also we also do every quarterly um, what we call tablao shows which are traditional flamenco shows and what we've done is we have uh, worked with venues so we get a free venue but of course it's like it's, it's, it's a very simple venue it's just a space and we put our floorboards you know we have to bring our makeshift lighting sometimes and we bring our own sound equipment so we set everything up ourselves and um, we even through the ticket sales, uh, be able to cover the overseas artists like musicians. Wow. To come. So mm. basically, those are paid shows. So we, we found that we have we have grown an audience because like our tabla shows are usually fairly sold out. Uh, sometimes they are so sold out that, that there are no more no more seats left like to sell. Uh, they're usually about seventy per, per seventy packs per sitting, and we usually do two shows in one night, like mm. separate shows. Yeah. So we've been doing that like for the last few years, doing our own, and, and that's totally self-funding through ticket sales. And, and, and we are hoping to, to do more things that, 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 that could be self-funding, self, self -funding, but of course it's difficult when you want to do bigger 
productions in the theater that always cost a lot of money. And we will take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be talking about money. Hi, everyone. So uh, today we don't have any sponsors. So I'm going to take the opportunity to sell something of mine that I've been trying to get rid of. So here we have a pair of um, flamenco male shoes. The foot is here. Can you see? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay. Ew. Okay. Um, it's been worn twice. Um, but it's great. It has like nails here for your feet, so you can tap, tap, tap. And if it's your first time trying flamenco, you can please just take it off me. I've had it for four years, so um, I will freeze it before you get it. All right. So I'm just just drop me a comment on this episode. Just like, hey, I want the flamenco shoes. You will negotiate like a price or something. All right. Thank you, guys. We are back. And Welcome back. We are going to address a very important question mm-hmm. to all you artists, uh, new companies, uh, new producers, arts managers, um, people who are new to figuring out the funding system in Singapore. Um, Daphne here has now a lot of experience in applying for all kinds of funds. <laughs> uh, what are like some tips that you have for people who are looking to apply for funding in Singapore? Like hex tips mm. that so that they don't struggle the way you did okay um i guess um it's important to look through all the guidelines and 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 and, and uh, well there are two parts to the funding one is your project synopsis right mm. so uh, coming on the project synopsis um it's very important to be very i think be very concise clear clear about what 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 the project is really about and put your selling points, what you think is your selling points for the project. And of course, they will always ask you, how does this attribute the art scene? So think of how you want to say, how it will uh, you know, improve the art scene, contribute to the art scene. And they also ask like, how you measure the outcomes. So, and, 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 and I find that they do want you to say how you do that, mm-hmm. you know, gauge audience uh, uh, engagement, or, or, or feedback or you know things like that and also who you are targeting to so be clear that you have all those points who you, who are your target audiences etc uh, and then the second thing is your budget of course right so I find that there's there's no point um, putting a very unrealistic budget um, you you can more or less almost gauge what is the max that they're going to give you so yes yes so there's no point asking for fifty thousand dollars if you don't think that you know realistically you're mm-hmm. you're gonna get fifty thousand so so i i always um have a budget that i will trim to like let's say okay the whole project is only sixty thousand or fifty or whatever it is and i think i will get but you have you have to think first they're, mm-hmm. they're not going to give you all the money so you have to think where else you can get the money is it ticket sales? Is it another funding body? Is it private donors? And you have to think like realistically. You, of course, you can over budget a little bit, but not that much. You know, it's not like by ten times or something like that. <laughs> and, and 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 then you have to see realistically where the rest of the money is going to come in, mm-hmm. or, or or sponsorship in kind or whatever, and then have a ballpark, I, like like idea of. How much you think you you really gonna pitch to for this for this, like let's say with NAC PMP grant, how much you gonna pitch for this one? If you're gonna pay for how much you're gonna pitch for that one? If you're gonna ask for the foundation or whatever, how much you gonna pitch from them? Because and then it, it, it's good to ask the industry around. They probably will tell you some mm-hmm. you could tell some numbers. For example, for a, a one off project, maybe you're not gonna ask like some foundation to give you like fifty thousand. For example, you know. Maybe you will know that that's unrealistic. Mm. You're not I'm never going to give you fifty thousand. If you're going to sell fifty thousand dollars, you must sell something else. So so it's a bit of that that that, that balancing. But I, I think a very very good um the but, but the first thing that will interest the people first to even look at your project, 
I think it's your concept, your synopsis, mm. your concept, and and what 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 the ideas behind concept, the team behind the concept, etc. First, and then go, then then you think about the money part. Mm. Mm. When you trim your projects, what tends to be the first to go? Um, f- frankly, um, mm. we would need to have a lot of um, a lot of a lot of the things um, are done by the dancers themselves. Mm. Example, marketing and publicity. Do we have a marketing and publicity? We don't have a marketing and publicity person. We are the marketing and publicity. We do our own posters. We market our, our thing. So, 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 um, although it's a volunteer, I put a number to it, but you know mm. that that can be in kind, like, you know, it's our, <laughs> we will, we will. <laughs> So, so some, but, then, but then of course you still need to put some money like some cash you still need mm. to spend some money on it so 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 th- those things like that like 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 stage hands if the uh, uh, venue is not the kind that doesn't allow you to allows you to bring your own stage hands and own background people those are the those are the things that really save <laughs> some of the things that that can save like for example the last one will be a good one center a stage mm. hand with my son <laughs> and his friend <laughs> <laughs> and, and then our, our and another, the ASM was was one of our our our, our students, you know, who who, has, who really could help us. And he, she was also helping Antonio do prop. Okay, and then the other thing that saved us a lot of money, I mean I'm not sure whether everybody could do that, is that Antonio makes all the props. Like the last time he made the, the big prop for the bar. Of course, we still spend money on the on the material, but then the label <laughs> was like, "I'm sorry, we cannot pay you because we don't have money to pay you as our prop maker. It has been included in your whatever artistic director choreography." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, ideally, we hope that we don't have to pakulia everything, <laughs> but realistically, when you want to do like your artistic projects, that that's what you end up doing. You end up pakulia, and also the studio, like like the rehearsals. Um, if I if we do have our space, I probably will not be able to rehearse the way we did because our mm. space is paid for from the classes that run there. So we collect the rent already to pay because I don't own the space, like I have to pay rent. But because I have enough money to pay the rent, then we have this space that like we can rehearse. Like if you want to rehearse under twelve midnight when we're done before, it's there. But if you had to like pay every hour of rehearsals, I also don't think we can afford it. We probably have to like find a HDB boy there. <laughs> or go and go to some living room. I mean that those are practical things. Every every hour counts. And when it comes to artistic project, you can't like like one hour the thing's over. It's not like this. You know, you, you spend a lot of hours creating the work and you also spend a lot of hours having to rehearse and refine the work. And there's you can't really put too much a time limit on, on those things. You 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 usually do it as much as you can with the time you have hmm. and, and, and and try to perfect it as much as you can. And that also includes like let's say like I play this role. Like besides rehearsing together with the group, sometimes I would want to as you know, rehearse by myself, like practice something by myself to get it like right or something like so those are hours that you cannot count, you know? If 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 a dancer or someone charges per hour of that, that's like that's really if, if we have to pay per hour of studio for those things, I, I think really the, 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 the budget would go like sky high the limit. So there were some things that, that, that we really um uh are lucky in a way because like all our our company are willing to all double up and pakali out including our artistic director. And also we have this space that we have a, a, our own space to rehearse. Mm. Yeah. And so do you think then that there's so much money that's involved in mm-hmm. making shows, dancing. Do you think if you didn't have a day job, you would be able to sustain this career? And tell us a bit more about the people in your company and the day jobs they have. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but Antonio doesn't have a day job. <laughs> okay, but besides that, a lot of us have a day job. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, for example, I'm a doctor. Uh, um, Toshi is a headhunter in a Japanese Ooh. firm. Yeah. Uh, Any Japanese viewers looking for work? <laughs> Yuri is um, I don't 
don't even know what she does, but I know it's like... It, like it's, research? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Assistant mm-hmm. researcher. It's academic. Not TV. Yuri. Yuri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, Yuri. <laughs> Something to do in that field. <laughs> well, Tilly, Tilly now has, has... I mean, she used to be different things, so she used to not uh, only work part-time when she had kids, then, then, then she used to be a research marketing person. She used to own another studio, and that was her job. And but now she actually is teaching full time as 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 like she's using she's yeah earning money mm-hmm. by teaching filmmaker and performing. Uh, Mamiko has has a kid, but she's also teaching, yeah. Um, and then of course there there, there are others, and uh, most most of the other company members have a have a full time day job. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah. So it comes to whether I can afford. Well. Uh, probably if actually the funny thing is that because I'm so involved in the like I'm the one like 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 I'm the one like writing the grant I'm the one actually planning things you know like always like doing things a lot of people think that I don't have any other job because when my students found that I was a, a doctor they were extremely some of them were extremely surprised <laughs> <laughs> like I said, like, oh yeah, I go to work. Yeah, I still go to other work. I mean, like <laughs> this is my work, but I have other work. I have going to other work. <laughs> so, um, because I came into Pinangpo at the point that I was already working, mm-hmm. and then soon after I had kids. So of course, if you ask me now, I would say that it would be very hard to sustain my living if I didn't do my work now and 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 just did Pinangpo. I would mm-hmm. have to do a lot more teaching or something like that to survive and probably I would tell them cannot cannot go on holiday so much and go to Changi Beach only. <laughs> Whoa. Well that, that's reality. <laughs> right. <laughs> cannot, cannot, cannot drink good wine. Uh okay, you know just drink <laughs> You still can enjoy life, but it's a different person. So I think the real question and the question I think a lot of artists have is, are artists with day jobs real artists? Of course. <laughs> and there we have it. Well, um, I think you judge the, the, what artist is worth mm-hmm. by, by the art, the art making. Or the you know so I can't say that just because you have a day job you are not artist or you don't have a day job you are artist I mean mm-hmm. uh, one sometimes people judge by whether they earn money from from the art so mm-hmm. in that way yeah we are earning money from the art like I get mm-hmm. paid to perform like people actually pay me to perform right so <laughs> they think I'm worth paying for or they they think I'm worth buying a ticket for to watch mm-hmm. a, a flamenco show so in that way. If you if you think of that whether you have a job or not then yeah then any you you are an artist but I think it's it's not really about that either I think it's really about um uh what the art making is and then and, and then it's it's like since art making is for other people to see or to experience then if you feel that this art making um, is something that, that is worth people seeing or feeling or experiencing, then you're an artist. Whether you have a job or no job or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or whether that's your only job. <laughs> but of course, um, I would say that, because I, I did flamenco when I was a bit older, but if 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 I was a different person, and there, there is someone like, like that, like we have a student who's actually going to Spain like for two years doing flamenco full time. If I was a different person, it was a different perspective. Uh, and it was a time that, 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 that you could choose the path. And of course, the time that I don't have children yet. La. Or maybe the children also <laughs> okay. They will still survive. <laughs> but um, then, then it's very hard to say whether you would, you know, I will hard, hard to say whether I would really do art full time. I mean, I could choose. If I was much younger, I probably could choose. Now it's, I still could choose, but it's harder because mm. I started much later and I also have like a baggage now to take care. But it was like younger, like okay, uh, you know, the most like a, I would, you know, a lot of people would like go to Spain like for a few years and first like learn the art like really, mm. really deeply even before you try to make a living out of it. So that, that's what a lot of people do. Mm. See, I have a question. Yeah. 
how do you juggle motherhood, running a flamenco company, being a doctor, and taking care of Cookie? Um, okay. Uh, the, of course, the reality is not, I would say that I'm not perfect in everything. So there are a lot of, maybe there are a lot of shortcomings when it comes to sometimes. But I think in the, at the end of the day, uh, all the roles are very important to me. So, so I, I have to give time to the company or to the art or to, from, even for me, for myself in the art. Uh, I have to give time being a, a wife and a mother, being with the family. Uh, and of course, uh, with cooking. <laughs> and of course, I, 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 I still have my work. So I, have, I, I go out to work as well. So uh, you kind of proportion time for everything. Of course, sometimes... For example, when, when it's near production time, like, you know, you're rehearsing very, very late and you spend hours rehearsing. And sometimes I, I feel a little bit guilty towards the children, right? Because, like, okay, I'm kind of... <laughs> but, but then, then, well, I don't neglect them, you know? Mm. I, I, I still te- I text them or I still talk to them or I still go and check on them. But then, then, then usually I will make up after the show is over, okay, then I go and go, and go out with them, <laughs> go and see a movie or do something. <laughs> hang out, <laughs> hang out with them. So in a way, like you will, there will be times you have to sacrifice something. But then, mm-hmm. as long as those other you don't sacrifice so much that you completely you know ignore mm-hmm. the other thing, you you will find time to negotiate all mm-hmm. the all the parts. I think. Wow. Like say, like sometimes it's not perfect. It's not. Mm-hmm. But you can't say like a perfect mother. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I do housework and I don't make breakfast. I don't. Cook. Um, yeah so now Mm. I'm gonna want like I'm gonna ask some questions for dancers out there like what kind of advice do you have for dancers especially new young dancers uh, coming out of like schools like Basel or even Sota or do you think they should go into a dance company first to launch their career or do you think they can do it independently um, just based on your experience working with dancers and being a dancer yourself? I think it's a very individual thing. There are advantages and disadvantages of both, I think. Uh, a lot of people uh, do like being in a company. First of all, if they're very young, and the company gives them you know, a structured environment and also for them to, 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 to grow inside the company. And of course, uh, a company may be a little bit more stable as a young dancer but also a lot of people don't want to be limited by, by being with a certain company they like to explore other ideas because usually sometimes in a company I guess you have to follow what the company's vision is or the director and if someone who has a lot of other ideas sometimes this it might not fit like and maybe for that person um they prefer doing freelance or they prefer being an independent art, art maker. So I think it's both ways are okay. It but really depends on <coughs> being true to yourself and what you, you really want to do. Mm. Okay, Daphne, so I'm going to ask you the, the question. The final question. Um, and it's a question I think I asked you when I was 18. If you can remember, very long ago. I'm very old, even though I still look young. <laughs> She's 55. Yes. Um, it's a question of, let's say a young artist is just coming out of school and they're, you know, kind of uncertain about whether, you know, they should, you know, earn some money with a stable job while they, their artistic career is stable or they should go full time because there will be more time for their craft. Um, how would then would you give advice to someone like me? Well, I would say... Uh do what your heart wants. I think that's the most important. Do what your heart wants. Of course, do what you're good at, but also do what your heart wants. Of course, as you go along, if you decide to have like a arts career and, and you find you have no money to eat, I, very practically, like if you really have no money to eat, you'll find a way to survive. You might be washing dishes or you might go and... <laughs> and make coffee somewhere but I mean, I'm just saying like practical but at the same time while you're making coffee if that's your dream to do this art full time or do it as, ma- as many hours you can 
you will like you do it and 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 you find a way to survive like yeah. but you I, I don't think in Singapore it's so easy to starve to death. <laughs> But of course then, but if, if it's a time in your life that you think that that stability is more important, yeah. uh, you know, like uh, you prefer all the arts, it's not, you, you don't need to do it full time, you want to have a stable job, uh, you, you want to have, like buy a house or something, then, then, then that's what your heart wants at that point or whether it's at that point or another point, then then I think naturally you will, you will change. But I think like if your heart wants this and you purposely do the other one, Let's say your heart wants to be an artist, like the young dancer or, or, or actor or whatever, but because everybody tell you, I ah, no lah, that's very stupid. Go and go and go and go and earn money. Go and buy a house, but that's not your heart wants. I think in the end, maybe down the road you might regret it, or you might mm. you might feel that you didn't try. You know, something like that. I think. So I think like just go for what like, your heart wants. Wow. What you really want. Oh. Go, go for what your heart wants. T-shirts will be available <laughs> soon. <laughs> All right. right. So we've come to the final segment of the interview where we would like to help spread the word about something that you'd like to promote. So what happens is we'll give you 30 seconds to tell us about something you'd like to pitch and we will attempt to pitch it in song and dance. And maybe flamenco style. We should definitely do it flamenco yeah, style. Yeah, flamenco yeah. style. All right. And the 30 seconds begins. Okay, so... Uh, like I told you, we'll always be uh, organizing our own little festival. So we're going to do that this year. Um, it's going to be at the end of the year. We already have the dates and we already have a venue. Uh, we're going to do um, the House of Bernada Elba. We're going to restage it as a flamenco dance theatre project uh, directed by Antonio Vargas. and But also uh, with the aid of Claire Wong from Checkpoint Theatre. And it's going to be on the 29th of November to 1st of December. So far, we only put three shows on the Stanford Arts House Black Box. Okay, so you remember those dates and look out for them on our Facebook and Instagram. And also, as part of the festival, we will have workshops. And we're going to close the festival with something on the 6th of December. So come and watch mm. both shows. Because on the 6th of December, it's going to be something interesting. We call it Versatility and Fleming Asian, or actually Flam- Flamenco Asia or Fleming Asian. So we're going to invite flamenco artists from Asia and also local artists. And we're going to see how all these are going to cross culture. So far, we have Punama Debaya from um, doing Kata Flamenco uh, with us. And we also have invited the Open Score Project. Okay. And we're going to have other artists, so look out for it. Star-studded. Wow. Okay, now we will attempt to do all of that flamenco style for you. So Shanice is a professional flamenco performer. I really am not, but... And I... Uh, uh, Daphne, maybe you can sing for us. What should I do? You can just... I'm... I'm... Sc- Scared. So I'm going to leave this one to the professionals and do my work in post. And as this performance happens, all the details of the performance will be right here in big white text. Introducing Shanice and Daphne. Let me just come off the screen. Arts Club. Thank you again, Daphne, for coming on our show, and we will see you in two weeks. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ole, ole. Ole. We hope you enjoyed the Tropical Arts Club. If you'd like to catch more episodes, be sure to hit subscribe, and don't forget to follow us on Instagram.